Well, I'm an engineer, and um, my uh, view of the world is clearly colored by um, the practical aspects of the application of science. But how did I get there, I think, is an interesting story, and it forms a part of this book. I was born in Vienna to a middle-class family. My father was a lawyer. My mother was a dental surgeon. It was an unusual time because under the ailing Kaiser Franz Josef, the uh, Jewish people living in Austria were for the first time permitted to go to college. And my mother was one of the very first women to have gotten an MD from the Vienna uh, University. Our life was fairly uneventful until on March 12th, 1938, Hitler invaded the country. There was to be a plebiscite on a Sunday as to whether the Austrians wanted to join Germany or remain independent. And Hitler took matters in his own hands. And in the morning of the day of the plebiscite, he crossed the frontier with a huge army and took over. Actually, not very much happened for the first few months after Hitler took over. My father looked of himself as an Austrian Jew. In fact, he had been an officer in the Austrian army, had been wounded on the Russian front, had a medal for his bravery, and really thought that, you know, he could remain in his country. But all of these hopes came crashing down on a day which is generally referred to as the Kristallnacht. Kristall means glass. And on that day, a, the day before, a young deranged Jewish boy had shot and German consular official in Paris. But the Nacht, the night was well orchestrated beforehand. And the morning after, every shop that was owned by a Jew had been smashed and the glass lay on the ground and every synagogue had been put to fire and the holy books of the Jews, the Torahs, had been thrown into the street and trampled on by the stormtroopers to show their defiance. Stormtroopers marched through the city singing, Heute gehört uns Deutschland und morgen die ganze Welt. Today we own Germany, but tomorrow the whole world. I knew at that time that this was not going to be the place I could remain much longer. I did not realize at that time that this was really the beginning of the largest racial massacre that would eventually exterminate six million people, Jews and gypsies mostly. But it was clear to me that unless I could escape quickly, I would not survive. A few days later, all the Jews were separated from the other students in our gymnasium, and a separate school was established, which was uh, really a joke, because none of us went to class. We realized this was not any longer of great importance. 
we knew that the only way to save our lives was to escape. But at the time, none of the European countries and none of the countries overseas would accept Jews except three countries. One was China, one was Cuba, and the other one turned out to be Great Britain. The acceptance of Jews of Jews to England, however, was under a very strange condition. The British would allow children to enter the country provided there was somebody in the country already that would guarantee that the child would not become a nuisance and a public uh, uh, responsibility, and they had to pay a certain amount to accept the child. Well, um, formed what I would call a cabal of five students that plotted to get out. One was Robert, who wanted to be an opera singer. One was Wolfie, who wanted to become an artist. One was Paul, who wanted to become a doctor. And the fifth one was Rudy, and he wanted to become an engineer. All of the five had a plan. Uh, the first one to go was Robert. He was a good skier. He had a friend in uh, Switzerland, and he tried to cross the border on skis. Unfortunately, the border patrol, when he, they asked him to stop and he would not stop, shot him and killed him. Wolfi had a father who was a railroad engineer. In Albania, who, that was a Muslim country at the time and probably still would be considered so, needed a railroad. So they made an exception and let the family in, but Wolfi did not uh, want to stay in Mong the he was uncomfortable and he escaped further to France, joined the underground, was captured and sent to Auschwitz and gassed. A little while later a sixth student joined us. His name was Kurt Huppert. And we had always seen him in class, but there he was a devout Catholic. But the Catholic bishop of the cardinal of Austria, Itzinger, had decided to support the racial law of Hitler. And it no longer mattered what was your religion. What mattered was what was the birth of your grandparents. And Kurt's mother had been Jewish converted to Catholicism in order to marry his father, which he didn't know. And uh, when the uh, church records were opened and the school board discovered he had a Jewish mother, he was declared a Jew and he tried to join our group. He really was the most unhappy of the six of us. Well, I personally had no place to go, but fortunately my aunt, who had been a famous opera singer, had escaped the day Hitler came to Switzerland. She had an impresario in London, and he arranged for me to be one of the children to go on what is known as the Kinder Transport. A uh, film was made. It won the Oscar in the year 2000. Judy Dench is the narrator, and it tells the story of the children. When I arrived at the Vienna Railroad Station on March 12th, I was just a little over 15 years old. A railroad station in those days was a dismal place. 
The locomotive spelt black smoke from burning coal. That smoke adhered to the inside of the station's glass enclosure, making the railroad station appear gray. Even when the sun was shining outside, it was early morning when I arrived, but it was already teeming with two or three hundred children ranging in age from three to 16. This was a day when one of the first of the many children's transports was leaving Vienna for London, a desperate off effort designed to save children of Jewish ancestry from the persecution of the Nazi regime. I did not know any of the children. The one thing that all of us had in common was a piece of cardboard around our necks containing a number. That number was to identify each child to the unknown foster parents in London who had offered to accept one of the refugees under the auspices of the Kinder Transport. Under the regulation of this transport, each child was allowed only one piece of luggage. I had a knapsack and in it I had some clothes, an extra pair of shoes, a raincoat, and a tin box that I used in Vienna to carry my lunch to school. On my arm, I had a steel Omega watch, which my father had bought for me a few days before departing. I have kept this watch next to my bed as a memory of that fateful day that changed my life. This watch was traded for the gold watch because none of the children was allowed to take any money, jewelry, or rare metal with them. When we arrived in London, we were met by usually a policeman. And what a pleasure it was to see a man in uniform who would not uh, uh, scare you half to death but was friendly. In fact, they brought us cocoa. And I call this drink of cocoa my freedom drink. I was fortunate enough to find a family that would accept my little sister. And my parents were able to leave Europe on the very last ship before the World War started. My sponsors in London were a very wealthy couple that had uh, a lot of friends in high places. On the way from Vienna to the Hawk, which is the port from which the ships go across the channel, on the way from the railroad, I saw hundreds of tanks. I heard warplanes. I saw armored vehicles. It was the day that Hitler violated the pact that was made at Burstis Garden between him and the French Premier de Ladier and the British Prime Minister Chamberlain, in which Hitler promised that if he was given the last remaining part of Europe that had German-speaking people, the Sudetenland, which was part of Czechoslovakia. He would never again have any more territorial claims. Well, that night, it was clear that Hitler did not intend to keep the peace. And I had seen this huge war machine before I came to England. But there, the people were in total denial of the danger that loomed over Europe. It was an existential 
changed because the power structure was clearly moving in the direction of the Germans. And here I was, 15 years old, and I had seen this, and the sponsors I had, the name was Solomon, had a dinner, and I had the audacity to get up at that dinner and say, I want to tell you that Hitler is going to invade Europe because I have seen all the tanks and all the airplanes, and the people here don't do anything. Well, needless to say that I was put down, told that, uh, oh, a little boy just uh, escaped from uh, Germany. And uh, from then on, I just felt totally hopeless in the sense that I kind of knew it was going to happen and nobody seemed to care. Well, I was very fortunate because the labor shortage in England, because England did start to realize that a war was coming, made it possible for me to take a job because one of the conditions that the children were permitted to enter England was they would not work and take a job away from a British citizen. And I ended up on a farm in Wales that was run by uh, two young people. And, uh, well, I learned how to milk cows. I learned how to harrow the field. We got up every morning at five o'clock in the morning. And uh, uh, it was a very happy time. There's particularly one morning I remember when we were having breakfast and, uh, well, we had uh, tea, we had bread, we had cheese, we had milk, and a couple of other things, fruit. And we also had some marmalade. And I liked marmalade and I took a, a piece of bread and I spread some marmalade over it and afterwards the uh, housekeeper said, Frank, you can have all the cheese and butter you want, but marmalade we have to import, and therefore we are not self-sufficient in that. So please be sparing. I did not ask them where the tea came from, but I realized that that was a mentality that appealed to me, self-sufficiency. And it became a part of my uh, vocabulary that uh, went with me. There was something else that was a part of my life. When I was in Vienna and I did not have any opportunity in mind of escaping, I said that if I ever come out of this, I don't want to simply exist, but I want to try and make my life count for something. Well, this was a big challenge, but it's been a motto that has stuck with me ever since. I went to day school and worked at night. I had learned in England a little bit about how to read blueprints, I could run a milling machine, the drill press. So I didn't have any problems getting a job in a machine shop. It was uh, a rather tranquil period, although my parents who had escaped with nothing but the clothes on, your, on their backs didn't have a job, a lawyer who couldn't speak English, couldn't do much in an English-speaking country, and the MD from Europe for most of the uh, countries was not acceptable to allow them to practice. I started out in 
New York after crossing the Atlantic. I couldn't find a decent job. My friend Paul from the Cabal, who had settled in California, invited me to join him, which I did. And I started school at Los Angeles City College, then went on to UCLA. And I was pretty much able to hold a job and go to school, although I was not a very good student. I think I was asleep through most of the lectures, having had only about four or five hours of rest during the night. On December 7th, of course, the tranquility of our existence was shattered, war started, and life for all of us changed. I had a bad asthma. I don't know whether it was from birth or from whatever. And I was rejected from the army. I was declared for F. So I decided I might just as well try and become more able to help in the war effort. And I finished my engineering education at Berkeley, where I had the good fortune to be a student of a professor by the name of L.M.K. Belter. He considered himself an international. L stood for Lan Huachlan, Welsh. M for Michael, Michel, and K for Carl. He says, I'm whatever you need. But his specialty was heat transfer. And there were only two places where heat transfer, which is a special part of thermodynamics, was taught. One at Berkeley, and the other one was MIT. I sort of became a, a follower of LMK, as he was called. And when UCLA decided to establish an engineering school and Belter went back to Los Angeles, back for me, I followed. He helped me get a job at the Caltech Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Here I was, just barely graduated, with a degree and not even the best of grades. But we had a major problem. Our rockets that we were developing did not succeed in flying very far because what happened is that the high temperature that was necessary to get the thrust to propel the rocket needed to be contained. And the containment meant that you had to have a steel wall that held the hot gases, and you had to have a cooling fluid on the outside that could uh, take away the intense heat that was created by the combustion of the gases that propelled the rocket. And the answer to that puzzle lay in the behavior of bubbles. Because if you have bubbles created at a hot surface, they stir up the fluid. And like when you try on a stove, you take a spoon and you stir the water. These bubbles stir up the liquid and help to carry away the heat. The trick was to tame these bubbles so they wouldn't get too big and there would be many of them and uh, to uh, not permit a vapor film to form over the surface. We were fairly successful. 
I was permitted to build a laboratory, the JPL heat transfer lab. They had nobody else. And uh, I um, found the work stimulating, but frustrating because I thought that if I knew more mathematics, maybe I could model those bubbles. And so when the Guggenheim Foundation opened an opportunity for people to get a Guggenheim Fellowship, I applied, they accepted me, and I went on to Princeton where I uh, remained for two years. I was really not a skilled mathematician, I realized. In addition, I had more experience, had done more publishing than many of the teachers at Princeton at the time, and I did not feel totally at ease. So when the Atomic Energy Commission asked me to help developing a nuclear reactor, I accepted that opportunity and um, was told that my experience at JPL with these bubbles was exactly what you needed to run a nuclear reactor safely. Because in a nuclear reactor, you have intense heat that you have to carry away. I was asked to fill out a form to have the FBI check my reliability, my um, background. There was a Cold War on, and the fear of communists was intense. A former employer had told one of the FBI agents that he thought I was a communist. Uh, all the people that were involved uh, stood up for me, but I was not able to uh, clear my name. And I lost what is known as the clearance to work on uh, any material that is considered confidential or secret. And it was a blow to me because I had hoped to be able to contribute in making a peaceful application of atomic energy. But at that time, I was very fortunate. One of my former professors at Berkeley heard about me and said, hey, would you like to come to Berkeley? We have an opening, and we can put you on the faculty. Needless to say, I jumped at that opportunity and uh, uh, went directly from Princeton after I finished my last exam back to Los Angeles and was on my way to Berkeley. Well, my trip to Los Angeles was interrupted. I met Marion. <laughs> and we had not very much time together, but somehow we had a very common background in that both of us had been refugees who had lost their youth. I had to work and go to school. Marion had escaped with their parents to Cuba. And at the age of 16, she had started working in the diamond industry that came from Holland and Belgium uh, to Cuba. Uh, my daughter, Judy, who is right here, is fascinated by
by that story, and she has given a talk about it here before and is spending a good deal of time trying to uh, get the material together to, I don't know what she wants to do, write a book, do a video. Well, practical people, I had to go start teaching at Berkeley. We met halfway and got married. As it turned out, um, my not having completed the education at Princeton became a handicap at Berkeley. And the professor who I was promoted to assistant professor, and uh, the uh, uh, professor who had brought me to Berkeley said one day, Frank, I don't think you have a future here unless you're going to get your PhD. And well, here I was in my 30s. I was not going to stop life to get back to school. And I started looking for a job that did not require a PhD. And mind you, in those days, even at Berkeley, only about half the people in engineering, which was considered a more practical, uh, uh, not a science, but uh, engineers were considered practical people. Only about half had gone beyond the master's degree, which I obtained from UCLA with Berlter. I was able to get a position at Lehigh University, and I began to write a book that I thought would be accepted in lieu of a PhD. It was called Principles of Heat Transfer. And the book became an obsession, I must say. It almost ruined our marriage, but it was a success. It was the first book that really put the new topic of heat transfer into perspective. It has been translated into seven languages, and it, happy to say I'm working on the eighth edition right now. <laughs> Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania was not my favorite spot. Every summer, uh, Marion packed up our kids. We put them, I had at that time a big green convertible put them in the car and drove to California where our parents lived. On the way we passed through Boulder. I fell in love with Boulder. And every time we passed through Boulder, I would stop and say, you got a job for me? <laughs> I left my CV and lo and behold, one day I get a letter from uh, Katie Wood, who was head of aerospace engineering, said, yes, we have a job for you. Lehigh was very generous, let me take my equipment, and I came to Colorado. I have loved being in Colorado, and I think that you agree with me. We have ample sunshine. We have everything that it takes to make the state into a sustainable, renewable entity if we decide to do so. But my um, efforts were, um, how shall I put it, clarified when I uh, got involved with a um, effort by um, the Atomic Energy Commission to free the natural gas that we have in Colorado by placing nuclear bombs underground and exploding them. It was part of what is known as the Project Plowshare, coming from Isaiah, making your weapons into plows. And uh, 
I had, I was director of a project at the time that was studying applications of new technology to help society. And we investigated the efforts of the AEC. Well, for more than 50 years, oil companies had done what the AEC was trying to do. They had bored deep into the earth many thousands of feet, put an explosive at the bottom, and then tried to fracture the tight formations to bring out the natural gas. For 50 years, this has worked very nicely. Nobody had complained, and the AEC came and said, that we now have an explosive many times that of what you have used in the past. Maybe we can get a lot of natural gas out of the earth. Well, it did not pan out, and our studies suggested that using nuclear weapons, nuclear bombs, as a means of stimulating natural gas flow was a mistake that would not help the country's energy problem. We went to court. We tried to stop any further explosions. I had a town hall meeting. I uh, debated with Edward Teller, who calls himself the father of the H-bomb. But we could not stop another AEC effort. They buried three bombs underground and set them off. And once again, the effects were minor. The gas was radioactive. And my uh, co-director at the time, Dr. Catherine Wen, then started a popular movement that put a um, clause into the Colorado Constitution, which was voted upon by the citizens of Colorado and says that no more nuclear explosions without the specific permission of the citizens that had to be voted on. And I became rather disillusioned with nuclear power as a means of helping our energy crisis. At that time, the idea of solar energy was only a flicker in the mind of a few people. But as some of you may recall, Congress, led by a few foresighted people, decided to establish a institute specifically devoted to developing solar energy as a means of solving our energy problems of the future. I made an effort to bring the institute to the University of Colorado, but the dean said that he did not believe solar was much of an energy source for the future. We should stick to oil and coal and gas. Well, fortunately, the successful bidder for the Solar Energy Research Institute, Midwest Research Institute in Kansas, decided to come to Colorado and build the institute here in Golden and asked me to become the chief of the heat transfer section, the thermal energy division of the institute. And now I read from page 141 my enthusiasm for participating in a proposal to establish a solar energy research institute was buoyed further when President Jimmy Carter outlined his proposed energy policy in a televised speech on April 18, 1977. He began with a historic statement, quote, with the exception of preventing war, this 
namely the energy crisis, is the greatest challenge our country will face during our lifetime. The energy crisis has not yet overwhelmed us, but it will if we do not act quickly. And he went on to say, we simply must balance our demand for energy with our rapidly shrinking resources. This difficult effort will be the moral equivalent of war. My colleagues and I, both at the Institute and later on at the university, began to uh, develop a strategy for making a transition from fossil fuels to sustainable renewable energy sources. This transition is not going to be easy. It's going to take an enormous amount of effort. And for it, we developed what I call the energy return on investment strategy. It is based on a very simple concept. I call it the law of the low-lying fruit. When you imagine having an apple orchard and you want to pick the apples, you first go and pick the ones that you can reach just walking or as this man here lying down, reaching up and getting an apple. That's very simple. And the energy involved in getting the apple is minimal. But once you have picked the apples from below, you can't reach the ones higher up and you've got to get a ladder. Well, the ladder requires somebody to cut trees, to uh, fashion the ladder, to put it together, to glue. In other words, he has invested energy to make it possible for you to get the next crop of apples. After you have done that, you have still more apples at the top and you're going to get a picker. And that picker is steel. It needs uh, gasoline or diesel. And a lot more energy has been invested to get the energy of the apples at the top. Eventually, you have picked most of the apples and uh, uh, it begins to look less interesting because the energy involved in getting the apples is more than what you get out of eating them. Well, the same applies to all the fossil fuels. When we started the oil boom in Pennsylvania, 1900, all we needed to do was drill a hole and out came the oil. With the input of one BTU of energy, we got a hundred BTUs worth of oil. Pretty soon, that oil source was exhausted and we had to go far afield to the Middle East. Then it required ships to bring the oil. It required loading docks and an enormous amount of energy. The Middle East is drying up. We are now building oil rigs in the middle of the ocean. The amount of energy required to bring up the oil now is 10 times or more that it was around the beginning of the era. And if you think of bringing in the oil from some of the frozen steppes of Alaska or the polar region, there is very little excess to build a sustainable energy system. After escaping from the pending Holocaust, I felt a deep subconscious need to accomplish something that would make my life count. Finding that something was a long and tortuous path as this book demonstrates. But as my life progressed, I became convinced that the fossil fuel era will end soon. 
and to survive as a civilized people, we have to plan for a transition to a sustainable energy future on our planet Earth. The fossil era is like a mere flicker in the history of evolution. Whether or not we can survive after the fossil energy supply has peaked will depend on how we adapt to life with an ever-diminishing supply of natural resources, especially liquid fuels. The current perspective that growth is necessary for the economic health is not sustainable for the future because energy does not obey the so-called laws of economics. I think we're going to have to substitute the word conservation for growth in order to survive. But our choices are two. We either will go the nuclear path or the sustainable energy path. Many countries have no choice. Japan has to go nuclear because they have no renewable sources. Finland is building the biggest nuclear reactor. But we are blessed with a choice. And I have been an active part of this energy revolution. And in this book, I describe my experiences and I'm hoping that I have made a contribution to a peaceful transition to a sustainable, renewable energy future.